and welcome. Let's open with a moment of prayer. Oh, Lord God, you are the God who spe doesn't speak just in the whirlwind or the fire, uh, but you speak as a still small voice to us in the quiet of this half hour, in the words of Holy Writ, uh, you, Holy Spirit, comes to fuel us and to fill us with yourself. Uh, thank you for this respite in a harried and busy day, and uh, give us uh, peace and comfort and learning and uh, uh, continued hope as we study you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, everybody. After a, a weekend, I maybe uh, would ask, uh, was it a fruitful weekend for any of you? We had we had a wonderful worship service and a Bible class that spoke. Uh, we discussed the the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, and had an opportunity to look at the integrity of Scripture to some extent, and we'll be continuing that uh, next Sunday. So. We're ready to continue with the uh, book of Mark. And by way of uh, review, uh, review of Mark. So really, really good. the outline of Mark, let's see if we can, uh, I have written some things down here. We had verses one through 13 of chapter one, a prologue. Jesus was in the wilderness, uh, the, John the Baptist in the wilderness, uh, his message and the baptism of Jesus, Jesus' temptation, where he goes into the wilderness. And the wilderness was thought of as where Satan dwells, where the unclean spirits abide. So that's who he meets in the wilderness and is tempted by Satan. Then he begins in verse 14 of chapter one, his ministry in Galilee. You remember the whole first year of his ministry down in Judea is not mentioned. It's mentioned in John, first few chapters. So now we're like going into already the second year of the three, three and a half years of Jesus' ministry. He's in Galilee and in the surrounding regions uh, and he calls his disciples. Uh, he has a ministry right there in Capernaum and out into the Galilee. Uh, he defends his uh, ministry, ministers to the multitudes, commissions the 12, and then he rebukes. And there's a number of rebukes, including the one today with the wind, the rebuke of the scribes and the Pharisees. He's kind of putting the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the wind and the demons all in one pot uh, uh, in, in this gospel. And in so doing, further identifies his spiritual family. So that happens in chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. Then there is a section from chapter 4, verses 1 through 34, which we just looked at where he lists um, six parables. There's the parable of the sower, which is the parable of parables that kind of defines where he's going with everything. Uh, then the reason for the parables, then the parable of the sower explained. Then he talks about the lamp and the seed, and then the mustard seed, in, uh, which, which is right before where we get today. Once he preaches his parables, he now, uh, in further unveiling who he is to those who have eyes to see, he is going to demonstrate his power. So now in chapters four and five, he will demonstrate his power in four specific areas uh, to show that he is God over all things. He is the Yahweh God, who of all the gods, of all the, the uh, beings and idols and beings in heaven, he is the one who makes all things and controls all things. And so he will be the one who has control over 
nature, control over unclean demons. He's the one who can heal the sick and he is the one, and this is the capstone of the section, who can raise the dead. So he goes right to raising the dead and then that becomes a precursor to returning back to his hometown and uh, what's going to happen for the bulk of Mark, which is the final week of uh, Jesus' life uh, there as he prepares to uh, die for the sins of the world and then rise again. So with that uh, background then, uh, let's turn to our Bibles, chapter four of Mark, beginning at verse 35. And this is what we're gonna cover today. We're gonna cover this one story. So on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. They're at the Sea of Galilee, around 690 feet below sea level, a very treacherous place because of the winds that can suddenly come up. And leaving the crowd, remember he was on the boat preaching to the crowd, they took him, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. So I mean, I'll picture this now. He was in the stern asleep on the cushion. Now, and every little boat back then, they would have a, a, a blanket and a pillow near the stern where the helmsman would be for the guest of honor, if there is such one. That's where that person would sit and Jesus, tired from a day of ministry, was sound asleep so much so he didn't even hear the storm on the water, the water coming into the boat. A very perilous situation. So they woke him and said to him, teacher, this gives you some idea of where they were in terms of their belief system at this point. They called him rabbi, teacher. Do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. There's a couple of things that jump out at me as I look at these words. When he awoke, he rebuked the wind. Now he had rebuked the Pharisees, he rebukes the demons. He says the same words to the, to the storm, the, the wind, as he said to the demons in chapter one, verse 25. Well, he says, uh, be still, <laughs> don't speak, don't act out. Uh, and, and I begin to think about that, uh, how the people back then be believed that demons were behind everything, right? And yet, don't we name some of the winds, like the Sirocco winds or the, the, uh, the uh, Santa Ana, Santana? winds uh, after kind of diabolical uh, ideas. So there's a, there is that. And um, the other thing that you notice is that when he gives a word, a command, the, the wind did not just cease slowly. We saw this again in Jonah with the, with the Lord God, when he said, stopped the storm, it just stopped just like that, like there wasn't even a storm. Here too, the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Remember, they've been with him for over, well, almost two years. And they were filled with great fear. Now that word fear, I can look it up here, in the Greek, 
uh, is phobos, phobia. Uh, and it is to, to be uh, struck with terror or it's struck with reverence, a supreme reverence for something. And in this case, it, it refers to fear the Lord God. That means have reverence toward the Lord God, not be afraid of them. And the there's a little there's a little uh, saying that goes like this: the only thing more terrifying than having a storm outside the boat was having God inside the boat. <laughs> Isn't that kind of neat? Mm -hmm. They were afraid of the storm outside the boat, little realizing their biggest fear and trepidation and reverence ought to be the Lord God of heaven and earth there in that boat with them. I mean, wouldn't that give you the willies if you didn't know if you believed? I mean, that is something that is far more than the storm. They were filled with great fear said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Okay, I am going to turn it so you can see one another, and uh, we want to be able to reference, of course, the verses, but let's talk a little bit about what we just, just read. And if you are a student of church history, you know that in the medieval ages, especially, there were several ways every passage would be interpreted. One would be a literal translation of what took place. But for many of them, even of far more import was the symbolic uh, or allegorical uh, value of the passage. And if we're just looking at the physical aspect that Jesus calm the storm, then the miracle is external to us. It happened, it's a fact in history, shows he's God. But if it's also symbolic, then it's internal to us. Because then we can allegorically say, well, he stilled a lot of storms in my life. Storms that were raging within me of doubt, of anxiety of fear, of uncertainty. And he spoke the word into my heart and suddenly they were all gone. And that too is something to be said because that's exactly what took place for the disciples as they came to know him and follow him. There was that sense of change in, in their heart and their lives. Okay, any, any uh, questions or comments? Well, well, go ahead. Well, okay, yeah. I'm just struck by um, God. It's like, you know, we, God, we know that God allows things to happen in our lives to strengthen our faith. And I think I see this as one of those instances where, you know, if, if you would want to, they could have had a calm sea all the way across, but yet, you know, this was done to continue to teach the disciples but, and to show, because he knew they, they still didn't understand and they still didn't fully believe. So I think that was a... Good, good, good point. You know, by the time he's done in chapter five or six, he will have done everything the Messiah was called, uh, it was evidence to do in the Old Testament. That he would have fulfilled all of these things the Messiah was going to do, except he himself die and rise again. And that would be coming later. And, uh, and yet he also did it. Do you think, uh, Mike, that uh, he did this to show, um, basically to show his disciples who he was? I think he did it to show them who he was, but I don't think they still understood. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he, he was showing his, you know, he, like their, their, their reaction was, who is this who could even calm the wind? So, um, they right. still, 
they didn't understand, but they, they, they saw the power. Yeah. Well, if you go to, to uh, if you go here and then, and then go to chapter eight, He goes to the place where Satan has his headquarters, which is Caesarea Philippi and uh, Mount Hermon. This, this was the place that, that, that uh, people that worship Satan were afraid to go to. He climbs this mountain in the, in the area there. Uh, and, and then he talks to them about this. And who do people say that I am? And then this is the pinnacle. This, this, is this, this is the profession of faith moment for Mark. And in every gospel where this is found, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they come from that pinnacle and they go down into the back into the valley. And from then on, it's all about Jesus' suffering and death and how we're going to follow him. We're going to face the same thing as Jesus. He said, who do people say that I am? They say different things. And he asked them, but who do you say I am? And Peter answers, you are the Christ. And not um, you are a teacher. But finally, they start to get it. Not fully. They're vacillating until Pentecost. And he charges them to tell no one. Because in the secrecy motif of Mark, He's going to spill the beans after he has died and risen again. Now he has the credentials. Now everyone, uh, well, yeah, I believe he's Jesus. I he's the Messiah. No, he is. He died and he rose again. He is the Messiah. And so he's waiting till that happens. Other thoughts, comments? Uh, Karen? I had a comment that going back to different interpretations of the Bible, it's one of the most fascinating things about the Bible and what draws people there is you read it one way, but oh, look, I can read it this way and then it's something else. So, I mean, we keep looking and reading because we get more and more as we read it. Well, that's, that's fantastic, Karen. If when you read the Bible, you can always say, what does this mean? And then say, what does this mean to me? Mm -hmm. How does this a, a, apply to my life? But that, also, what? how good. does it apply to God, to Jesus' life? Because many times it's turned 180 degrees around. And you look at it from his viewpoint, and that's, that. I mean, that's like an aha moment. And it happens all the time. Yeah. It's such a peace. Such a peace. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn? I just think it's interesting um, how Jesus spoke to the water or to the storm. Um, it's like he's having a talking relationship with another person. Um, he doesn't say storm, stop. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 uh, it's like he's talking to a person. Well, he says it with authority. Well, he does say it with authority, but it's. Like so he's familiar. Have... He knows it intimately. He yes. knows it because he created it. So God, for... I heard this beautiful song. Um, I don't know who sings it, but it's, it's about how sometimes God calms the storm. Sometimes God calms the, the person in the storm. Yes, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Good comments. And uh, Roly? Roly. Well, um, I, I feel like I have to say something because two weeks ago, um, the, this uh, particular path, um, story came into my life really strongly. Two weeks ago, I was like a Sunday, we got a call from one of our kids and they were in trouble and it was like, oh no, there's some serious problems. And then the other one came in with some really bad news. And uh, I'm thinking, how do I pray for this? And this story came to my mind and I found myself wanting God to calm the storm. I felt like I was in a boat and, the, you know, there's everywhere the water was rising up and splashing and going to overwhelm me. Um, I was, I felt a little guilty about this, but I did find, find myself crying out, Jesus, wake up, <laughs> calm the storm, please. And I thought, gee, you know, what kind of faith do you have that you think that you have to call on Jesus to wake up? 
But that's what I did. This storm, this uh, this story came to my life, and sure enough, he's in the process of calming the storm now. Oh, praise God! <laughs> hand up there. You know, I was thinking kind of along the lines of what Roly is saying. They had faith in Jesus. I mean, they woke him up. They said, "Teacher," as if you're in control. How come you're not taking care of this? So it's not like they were totally ignorant. It was beginning to dawn on them. And when they were in fear for their life, they turned to him. They knew where to turn, didn't they? Correct. That's a, that is an application. Sometimes it takes a storm for us to turn to the right one. Yeah. Well, look at in Jonah, the story, you know, those people weren't even Christian, but they turned <laughs> to Jonah <laughs> or to God, they're gods. <laughs> Doesn't it make you wonder, though, what Jesus expected them to do? He said, you know, uh, well, why wake me up? It's like, you know, don't you have any faith? What did he what did Jesus expect them to do? Calm the storm or not be afraid or what? Walk Pray? on water walk on water <laughs> not be afraid not be afraid yeah well yeah, that is amazing uh you know they were when they woke him up and said the Lord, and then he then he turns around and said don't be afraid what you're afraid of everything's calm now it's amazing yeah well, i'm uh, i'm not trying to uh compare maryland to jesus uh, <laughs> but <laughs> She's told this story before, what was it, three years ago, she was with our daughter and they were uh, in Alabama and they were facing Hurricane Michael oh, yeah. and Marilyn fell asleep on the sofa and her, one of her grand, the granddaughters came and woke her up and said, Gigi, why aren't you awake? Why aren't you afraid? Um, you know, and I mean, it, I say that, you know, God, Jesus says these things. He always says these things with the complete assurance that, that they will happen. Like there's a storm. He tells it with authority or he tells the person to rise or, or uh, get up and, and walk. Uh, he just, and he's he trying to give us that example of, of having that faith. And it's, it's, it's hard for us people because we still, well, we still don't believe as we should believe. or have this faith that we should have it. This, uh, thank you, thank you, Mike. This question that was uh, brought up: Why, why didn't Jesus? Why did he? Why was he sleeping when he? Why did they have to wake him up? Shouldn't he have been in charge of this? And um, why do you think he stayed asleep? What was the purpose? Heavy fatigue. What? Fatigue. Fatigue. He wasn't worried. I think it was a lesson. I didn't hear that. I think it was a lesson. I think he was talking to Dean. Oh, Dean said. Oh. I cheated. It says here at the bottom of my uh, Bible, it says that right. Jesus was sleeping in the case, lack of fear, and also great fatigue. He'd been up for, he's, he's a human being. He's been up a certain amount of hours. So that's what I got out of it. It made sense to me, part of it, because he is, he is human at this point. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I just wonder, did Jesus think that they could rebuke the storm and that they should have done it? Or let it just play out and sit there. I mean, aren't we at don't aren't we told that we can call upon God when we're afraid or we're, you know, when there's trouble? Why does God so, allow storms to come into our life and it gets to a point where we have to cry out? Why doesn't he just fix it before it happens? Because he wants us to come to him. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's our growth during trial. Lean on him. If we had just to lean on him, we wouldn't grow. Some people need to be hit up the side of the head before they listen. <laughs> Not me, of course, but some people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I need it more than most, actually. You're on a roll, Mike. Keep on going. <laughs> well, no, I just got to bear this. 
Well, maybe they just, he just wanted them to tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, Jesus, you know, we're having a storm. Could you help us instead of getting all worked up about it? I don't know. I think, I think there's another, another thing that goes on and certainly happens in my life. Whenever you are in crying out to God and he answers you, what a wonderful, what a wonderful thing it is. And it's just a reassurance that God is present and cares about you and that he's, he's there. He's a very present help in time of need. And um, I think that's what happened to these, certainly happened to these um, disciples because they were in a place where they weren't fully trusting God, their lives to God. They were going to have to do that later on. So here's an example where they cried out, to God and God almost immediately says to them, okay, I've got you. Yeah. You know, and another thing that is so um, wonderful is that God already has a plan. I mean, mm -hmm. he already knows what he's going to do to take care of this. And that's so comforting to know that he's, he's in control, even if we aren't. <laughs> uh, God uh, sent angels to minister to Jesus when he was in the um, right after in the wilderness. He was tired then. He was hungry. And here's another time of tiredness. Um, so they it, it's part of the human. But it's also I think he was trying to show a lesson um, for them not to be afraid because he would not be with them forever. And he was preparing them. Jesus used every opportunity like this to teach his disciples. Yes. Something mm -hmm. a deeper, a deeper uh, relationship. Yes. Yeah. And it wasn't, and accepting him as the son of God was, was not something as God almighty control over, uh, over creation was not something that people were really coming to. They did this, they weren't getting it. And his disciples were, weren't getting it. So we remember that this is a period of mentoring disciples who are going to be commissioned to bring Christianity into the entire world. Yeah. There are just a, a boat full of them and a few, a couple, a few other boats of uh, other uh, outer, outer echelon disciples that are following uh, at, to see a whole lot of miracles about ready to take place, this one being the first one and after Pentecost and after the ascension, when Jesus has left them physically and they are alone with the Holy Spirit, with the commission and the antagonism and the, the, uh, the, the martyrdom, uh, they're going to go back <clears throat> and they're going to remember, don't mm -hmm. you think, these yeah. very things that happened. Yep. <laughs> these will be touchstones for their faith. Uh, just just like, at least should go back and remember and give the touchstones of our faith too. So what we should have another half hour and we <laughs> should ask the question, what are the touchstones for your faith? Right. Uh, Roly alluded a little bit to some of the things that happen with the kids. The touchstones that create faith uh, in your past where God allowed something to happen and then you had to and no recourse but to just fall on your knees toward God and say, you're going to have to solve this one, God. And then there he was, in one manner or another, solving it. And I, I could just, uh, that's what the writers will refer back and back to this time and again. Uh, Paul, Peter, especially Peter and the apostles, to the times that were with Jesus and what he did. And that's what they were caused to write down. 30 years after their time with Jesus. Remember, these gospels weren't written while he was with Je while they were with Jesus. This was written a generation afterwards. This was written in 50, 60 AD, uh, and that one of the earliest. So these were the, what the Lord caused them to write, but it was also very meaningful to each of the disciples. Yes, I remember that. And then it all began to click. Well, it's great, great. Uh, I hope you'll have spent some time thinking about the allegorical part and how as storms come into our lives, uh, how we finally get to the point where we ask the Lord 
to do something about it after we've tried everything else, I guess. And then there he is always with us. Let's uh, close with prayer and I will continue tomorrow. And by the way, uh, as I mentioned in my, my uh, email to you today, uh, I'll be out of pocket all next week because of conferences and the reunion in St. Louis. So think of who wants what day next week to be a leader. And uh, I need some people to step up to the plate. I can give you materials. It's just the facilitating. You should be quiet. I try to be quiet at least half the time and let That's others talk. You know, you don't have to talk all the time as a leader. That's not what a, you need to do. <laughs> you can facilitate it. Uh, it. And it's this is a group where we're all like a family. It's pretty easy to do. Any one of you can do this. And so think about that for next week, okay? Well, all right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, it's been so uh, delightful to get so much from your word today as we look at this one miracle of nature and to understand that, it, that your power over nature is the same as your power over demons, as this power over our illness and all of the infirmities of our life. And it's the same power that raises the dead. Thank you, Lord, for being a God of power, but also a God of love and care uh, that you might uh, see fit to have uh, not only given us new hope and life, uh, but also the power to recreate us in your image to be with you forever. So bless us tonight and tomorrow in our, in our ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.